All right, we're at BookCon 2015. I'm Rich Folley. This is BookView Now on PBS.org. We've been here for two full fun days. Lots of excitement. Lots of great guests all week. We're on our last segment right now. We have David Levithan's closing us out, but we also have Matt De La Pena. Matt's book is Last Stop on Market Street. But Matt, you have so many other great books. Ball Don't Lie, Mexican White Boy, many others. You said you're yeah. working on another one, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Sure. Welcome. Oh, thanks Good for having me. Pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure. And David, I know you all were on a panel together today. We were all, this, you're all coming from the We Need Diverse Books panel. We, we've been on lots of panels many, many together. Panels. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me how you guys know each other. I mean, we, we, God, we this is after good. Ball Don't Lie? Yes, yeah. Yeah, no, early on we were, we were both publishing at the same publishing house and I yeah. think it's just one of these conventions that's been I different. think you actually pulled me in socially and okay. then I became part of the YA community a little bit before yeah. I felt like I was kind of on the outskirts interesting yeah and now you can't get out of it now I'm in it I'm in it I'm in the club yeah. you're in sconce <laughs> uh, yeah exactly yeah, you're like built in but we, we haven't pre prevented you from doing things like picture books this is true I mean, who knew that the trick to getting on the New York Times bestseller list was to write a picture book? This, that's a shocking thing. When it happened, I was like, wow, I'm going to use this for all my books. Right, right. <laughs> so how, how did this book happen? I mean, where where does it come from? Well, I have one previous p picture book called uh, A Nation's Hope, right. it's a, but it's a biography. And this one actually started, the illustrator had a blog, and it was uh, kind of about his life before he was signed. He, he had never writ, uh, illustrated a book yet, and my agent showed me one of his blogs and it had a picture of him with his grandmother on the bus. And I loved this illustration. Um, I loved the vibe of it. And so I told my agent and he said, do you think you could write a book around that idea? And it just so happened that when I lived in LA for four years, I was on the bus. So I have a lot of experience on the bus and with you know, public transportation and just sort of noticing the different worlds, depending on what part of town you are with the bus, you know, using the bus. So that's how it started. And, and to be honest with you, it was a long process because our editor went on maternity leave. So I almost kind of forgot about this book. And then when it came out, we were so excited that it did so well, you know? So you had already written it and it yeah. was like basically waiting for it was the waiting editor to come for back. two years. Wow. So it was kind of a long process. Very long maternity leave. <laughs> well, it was just it's that suspicious. and the illustrations. <laughs> but, but it's it's rare though for a picture book author to actually know the illustrator's style while writing it. That's I mean, true. Did that inform you? Do you feel you wrote the book you did because you sort of had these illustrations? In I, mind? you know what, I would say no, just because I'm not savvy or experienced enough okay. to have done that. Right. But I do know that we worked kind of closely together, in a way that I know this usually doesn't happen. So we would actually he. He'd email me on a part of the text, and he'd email and say, do you think we could find a place for another animal in there? So it was kind of a collaboration it, during the process, which is, I know, not the normal path. How about well, just the, the, the compressed nature of picture books, you know, when you're writing the words? I mean, obviously, with a, you're, you're so expansive in a novel, you've got yeah. the big story behind you. You still have a big story in here. But you're telling with far fewer words. What's that challenge to kind of move between those two worlds? Well, it seems like it'd be very, very foreign because, you know, I have six novels and only two picture books. But I started with spoken word poetry. So the first thing I ever did when I was writing, I got a, pub a poem published. And so that's all I did probably for five years before I even started to write a novel. So in a weird way, writing picture books, is, it, it's like going home. Um, the hard part, though, is to try to, how can I have meaning in such a short book? Like, where's the takeaway? And that's where I took a couple wrong turns with this book. I tried to have big, heavy endings, and it was like, where are the parents? And it was kind of about him losing his parents. And then I realized in the final draft that I needed to just be simple. And so the last note of the book is super simple. We had Jason Reynolds here yesterday, and he was talking about um, you know, dealing with loss in a young kid's life. And, you know, I, I said something to the effect of um, a lot of kids don't even understand death. I mean, it's so foreign to them and so far away. And he, he reminded me that, like, that's not so for a heck of a lot of kids, whether it's disease or other things, um, that there's loss in young kids' lives a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, um, so when you, when you thought about that, I mean, are you finding connections with kids? And what's your take on, on that sort of world out there of young kids who've lost someone very close to them? Well, it's it's interesting you say that because in this book, we decided, or I decided, to 
not address it, but to make it just the reality. So I feel like in another book, it would be about the loss. This book is just about him with his grandmother. Grandmother, And to be honest with you, I would say 99% of the readers don't think about where are the parents. Right. So I think similar to the way I work with race in this book, it's, it's just, it's not about that issue, but it includes that issue. Right. So I guess it's not directly confronting death. Yeah. So tell me your poetry, when you were writing poetry, um, were you writing to a specific audience like you do when you're thinking about your books? Or were the, the themes very similar to the, the, the themes that you're covering uh, in all of your books? That's a good question because my poems were exactly the same things as my novels. Mm -hmm. Were they considered is, adult poems? I mean, they would be adult poems. Actually, you know what, let me, let me pull back. I was writing about the college experience and the high school experience. So I guess that in a weird way they probably were YA. But there was a lot of cursing. <laughs> hey, wrong with cursing in yeah, life. that's true. But I think I was really. In, I'm, I'm mixed race, so my my dad's Mexican, my mom's white. All my poems were about being mixed, and they were about my neighborhood, which was right on the Mexican border. Do you still write poetry? I, you know what, I don't, but I still read it. Yeah. 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 There seems to be something happening with poetry now too. I mean, you're seeing some really wonderful things. Happening with oh, there's here. amazing sort stuff. Of a public embrace of it, and you know where it seemed to be sort of an esoteric thing for scholars or something. Yeah, like that. it seems to really be. I mean, whether it's slam and things like that, which sort of open the door, but there's a lot of other things happening. I love slam poetry, though. I think it's incredible the rhythms and, yeah. and I think hopefully novelists take that poetic sensibility into their novels. You know, try to make good sentences. You know, try to be sparse. Try to be economical with language. So I think reading poetry really informs writing novels, and reading picture books now that I have a one-year-old daughter and we read picture books to her all day and it's incredible the poetry you find in, in the good picture books yeah yeah the cadence I mean especially when you're reading them over and over and over again oh yeah you start to like get good at it you start to like oh, work yeah. it up it becomes a performance oh I yeah, could do so. good night moon right now <laughs> out on 40 seconds <laughs> that, that's yeah. one of her go-to's oh man <laughs> that, that's the one that puts her down every night yeah. you know, the, God bless it I know good night moon has a really mysterious cadence to it that I've never fully understood, but something about it is right. so magical. And I think the mysterious part of it is what keeps the parents interested. In. Like, yeah, right. good night, nobody? Yeah. Like, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, I keep thinking about that, you know? <laughs> good night, nobody. You're right. You're right. I think, uh, so was it the birth of your daughter that, but obviously not, because it was sitting no. out there for a couple, you know, for a long time. You yeah. had a kid just so you'd have somebody. Well, to actually, <laughs> I w I'm not above that. <laughs> I might have another one, so I have a you know a little maybe a boy and a girl, so I have a little cover some bases. No, you know, I just it's a, such an honor to work with a talented illustrator. It's just when you when you write this po basically a poem, and then you get back the first sketches, and they're literally just rough sketches, and you're like, this is awful, and then you see the finished art, and you're just so blown away that you know this connects with your words, so. I love the process. Um, I, I, I hope I get to keep doing them. I will say this, and I don't know if you've ever done this, David, but I did a school visit with really young kids recently, and these kids are hard. Like, you go in there <laughs> with this big plan. Usually I go into, like, rougher high schools. I had this plan of what I was going to do, and I go in there, and I'm like, what do you guys really want in life? And this kid goes, I want a machine gun. And I was like, okay, let's move on. <laughs> and yeah. then I said, what are you guys okay. happy you have? Like your parents, you know? And another kid was like, I like my head. And I was like, all right, <laughs> so that's a good answer, but right. you ruined my plan. So <laughs> they're tough. They're yeah. challenging. You have to find a way in. Yes. And, um, you know, sometimes that's the illustrations and drawing. Sometimes it's the way you talk about them. It's so true. That's tricky, for sure. How about your, let's talk about your, um, your novels. Sure. As they, um, on, a, on a heavier note, yeah, you're dealing yeah. with sort of really disastrous scenarios. Yeah. You know, and really so. just going hardcore. And also, I'd love to, for you to talk to you about sort of balancing sort of genre and identity there because yeah. again, it's a very different. From this your is this books. is a good question because I think it's something I've been thinking a lot about, which is like writing books that feature diverse characters in books that aren't about diversity, which I'm doing in this and I'm also doing in, uh, in my novels, my two most recent novels, which are The Living and The Hunted. And yeah, it's more commercial novels. I'd written some quieter books and I wanted to see if I could write a page turner, which is very hard. 
um, and I really respect people who write books that you just kind of kind of want to keep going. Um, but I wanted to feature, you know, mixed race characters in books that that are big books, and you know, ra race is going to come up because the characters are mixed and they're confronting a different demographic for the first time. Um, so you know, there are little tensions, but the book isn't about those tensions. So it's more about an earthquake and a pharmaceutical situation. So. The Hunted is the second book, and it just came out. And it's really fun to find my books penetrating a new demographic, which is suburban schools with mostly white kids that are reading about a, a mixed protagonist. And so I guess in a way, that was my goal. I wanted to see if, <clears throat> if that would happen. Mm -hmm. And it's just been such an honor to see my books in the hands of new readers. There seems to be a theme there, because Jenny Han was here the other day, and people ask her about, you know, there's actually, a, her book is the first time that a, a best-selling New York Times book has had a, an Asian-American on the cover. And yeah. they said it was like groundbreaking. And it made, you know, people in the Asian community, she said, cry. And yet, she's very clear that, like, she's not writing about an Asian character. She's writing about a girl, a yeah. girl with the universal experiences, who happens to be Asian. And yes, it maybe was a little bit groundbreaking to put that character on the cover. Yeah. But, She's particular about you know letting you know that like it's not an Asian story. I yeah, I don't want you to mistake it as that. Well, and here's the thing though, you know, if you think about it, you take Jenny Han when she was young, the books that were put in front of her mostly featured white protagonists, mm -hmm. but she pulled what she wanted to pull out of it, right? And so hopefully the same the same things happen when it's the opposite, when it's an Asian protagonist and a white reader. You know, it's still it's the universal and the human condition hopefully is the, is the takeaway yeah but i think it's incredible that there's an asian person on the cover of a bestseller i think that's that's a huge step yeah you know I think so too. and actually you know going back to your stuff like i love that you you have two boys kissing and then you bookended it with 10 years later in a new era of of this kind of book so i think these are the ground breaking things that that make real change it's going so fast. I mean, the change is happening so quickly to the point where we, we talk about things that are groundbreaking right now, but like how quickly gay marriage has been adopted by the nation and how quickly shows like Glee and other things and Ryan Murphy have changed the face of television. When will this not be groundbreaking anymore? When will this be like, when will we stop talking about it as groundbreaking? When will it just be ground? Just normal? <laughs> yeah. How long? I mean, could it be next year? For well, I have a theory. I think in... 35 years, there's going to be a panel at, at BEA that's going to be all uh, old, white, straight males <laughs> saying, when can we get our books in? Where you know, are why the white we? men? And I'll be on that panel, too, because I'm mixed. So <laughs> it'll be amazing. <laughs> it's very possible. Yeah. Well, listen, Matt, it has been wonderful to have you here. Yeah, thanks. David, so good to have you. This thanks has been a really compelling you. discussion. I've, I've enjoyed it quite a bit. It was a great way to end what I think has been a fantastic book con.